Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, great. So thanks for sticking around, and that was a very exciting sequence of talks. Um, so I want to, um, as promised, try to hit the middle of those. So um, Michael started out at the very detailed cell level. Miriam, Miriam zoomed out at the very macroscopic level. And I'd like to talk somewhere in the middle of this uh, with our version of the closed loop optogenetic control in neural circuits. This is some collaborative work with some students in the lab, uh, Michael Bolitz and Adam Willits, uh, Clarissa Whitmire is a former student, and Chris Roselle is a professor in electrical engineering at, at Georgia Tech. Um, so the goal, uh, going right to the point, um, is closed loop optogenetic control of circuits. And we work specifically in the thalamic cortical circuit, and it's a well-studied um, circuit and serves a prominent role in conveying, at least in the sensory pathway, of regulating information flow from the periphery to the cortex. And so it's a good starting point. And we desire fast, millisecond, robust control of neuronal, neuronal activity to drive trajectories ultimately to shape per steps in behavior. It's kind of a tall order. Um, and, you know, it turns out that natural patterns of activity that we observe in the brain are very, very complicated, and it creates a difficult demands for writing in signals. So we just don't know how to do this. Um, ongoing activity patterns um, are linked to modulated percepts and sensory pathways. So it's not just you can generically uh, imprint things on the brain, but we have to measure, uh, measure things and, and deliver them intelligently. And closed loop control is likely a part of future therapeutics, and we've seen them already um, uh, reading, read out device uh, elements already as part of DBS uh, technology. So I think the closed loop control is making its way into the clinic. Uh, so we're going to only see more of that as time goes on. So I'd like to argue, as many have here, is that, that um, we can use this to not just for important therapies, but as, as well as for function, uh, to investigate basic function, to disentangle coupled variables. And by studying the control signals, we actually get a glimpse of some of the underlying hidden variables that uh, uh, several have mentioned. Um, so some challenges. How, why is this hard? Well, fast millisecond control, heavy demand on hardware, filtering, A to D conversion, D to A conversion, et cetera, and software. Spike sorting, that hasn't really been discussed at all, but that's a major problem if you're trying to do large-scale recordings. Um, model implementation, algorithmic control, these are all real um, problems as we scale the problems up. Imperfect sensors and actuators, they're getting better, but we still have a ways to go. Complex, uh, noisy neural dynamics that adapt and change over time. These are really, really challenging problems. And, it, and then has been talked about a lot are the changes in brain state, fundamental changes in dynamics. Um, so what I'm going to do is take you through and really focus on some of the framework, uh, the basic control framework, some technical approach, and, and then some examples that, we've, that we have. Uh, and I'd like to get to the um, discussion of uh, state, which is, seems like to permeate a lot of the discussion uh, earlier today. So as has been cited a couple times, uh, the, the, there's a story associated with the John Newman paper. Uh, John was a PhD student with Steve Potter, as you mentioned. Uh, he and one of my students conspired to do some work together without us knowing about it, which is fantastic for uh, um, that students feel emboldened to do stuff like that. Uh, and then out of this popped uh, a really nice paper where we did the in vivo work and, and John um, uh, did a lot of really detailed in vitro work. Um, and it was really about clamping activity and, and it's a very, very technically solid paper. So please check it out. It's really good. Um, that's John. That's all John. But then we followed up on more recently um, extending this to more dynamic, tracking more dynamic patterns of activity in the, in the, in the brain. Uh, as well as trying to develop some more um, design principles for this. So uh, the basic setup that we've used is, is the following. Uh, we we uh, study the somatosensory pathway in the rodents. I'll present both data from both rats and mice. Uh, but the periphery is transduced the whiskers and follicles through the brain stem, through the thalamus, to the cortex. And we, we're all, all over parts of this different, different parts of the circuit. But in this particular example, we're recording extracellular activity in the thalamus with um, metal microelectrodes, um, sorting spikes and so on, single unit activity, and using that to then guide optical input where these neurons in the thalamus, and I'll show data from the cortex as well, have been caused to express light sensitive channels, in this case channel rhodopsin. Um, and in this particular version, the early version, we used a commercially available data acquisition system to do a lot of the programming. It had some hardware, some real time uh, modules in it, but that was totally insufficient, so I'll get to the uh, better version of that later. 
um, and, and so on. Okay, so this is the setup, and this is the anesthetized rat for the first view, but then I'll get to a awake mouse in a bit. And the signal chain, you know, it's hard, actually. There's A to D conversion, spike sorting, which single channel, no problem, but real-time spike sorting for multi-channel data is going to be a big problem for all of us if you're interested at the, sing at the single cell level, uh, multiple single cells. But then there's some um, observer, which is estimator of, active, of, of some variable you're interested in, uh, followed by controller design, some constraints that limiting the inputs, and then driving some B to A conversion, and, and then light um, uh, for this opt optogenetic control. So uh, if we imagine uh, doing a lookup table, the calibration was mentioned earlier. It's not uh, insignificant that you get different levels of expression in the different cells, and it's really variable, different batches of opsins and so on. But imagine putting in different light levels and getting different firing rates out, but then we could think about this as like a lookup table. You'd say, well, if I want 20 hertz of these neurons, I just use you know, 9 milliwatts per millimeter squared. It's all, all done, right? Uh, and in fact, you, you do get a lot of mileage out of that, but for various reasons, it turns out that closed-loop control is a good way to go here. So in this case, light input to the system, in this case, the activity that we're recording is single unit activity, spiking activity. We then have an observer that estimates the instantaneous firing rate, which is the variable that we use to control this. Uh, to compare with a, an, a desired firing rate can be variable in time, to then produce an error signal that a controller acts on. And, and this, ver this particular version is simple kind of undergraduate level PID control to then produce an output, which is the input to the, the, the light input to the pathway, to the system. But then you have to deal with different kinds of disturbances that come along, and there are all sorts of things that make the closed loop um, system attractive. This is an example of an open loop case where we're trying to drive the system at one hertz. The green is desired uh, firing activity to sin some sinusoidal modulation of firing rate. In this case, we're using pulses uh, of the uh, light for the channel rhodopsin in open loop. You just look up table and you drive it. And it doesn't do a terrible job over a fairly short time period. Uh, but the closed loop control tracks it really well. And one thing to notice is individual trials are shown with a lighter color here. Significant reduction in the variability of the, the way the, cells, uh, the cell responds in the closed loop control. And that turned out to be a signature. It turns out that um, the closed loop control really clamps down on the variability. And then if you wanted to, to investigate this, you can systematically add variable, variability back in. Can't really take it out. Um, so where the closed loop also really shines is if there's an, another a disturbance comes along. In this case, uh, a whisker disturbance served a purpose just to show, demonstrate. Of course, the open loop controller has no knowledge of this other input that we don't know about. It's unmodeled. And of course, at the time of the whisker stimulation, the controller doesn't track very well at all the desired firing rate, but the closed loop controller backs off and compensates for this in some way. So I know I'm going a bit fast. This is some published stuff. This is an actual trajectory of firing rate that we measured uh, in green from the awake rat in thalamus. We then replayed it in an anesthetized rat. So the goal was to track this kind of complicated green pattern of activity over three seconds or so. Uh, and the, the closed loop control is shown in black, does a relatively good job. The open loop doesn't do terrible over this period, time period. Um, but again, another signature is the variability. The Fano factor is measured by the variability divided by the mean is significantly larger in the open loop control as compared to the closed loop control. So it really clamps down on variability in the response, at least across trials. Okay, that was really fast, I understand. Um, so I, I wanna talk um, a little bit more about some of the technical details behind some of this and how we actually did it. So here's the closed loop controller, again, the, the setup. And, and in terms of how we actually do this, it turns out some of the things can be done offline. You start the, before you even start the experiment, we learned over the course of many experiments, we could design the, the observer, the estimator, offline. It was common across different animals, different cells, and so on. But then some of the things you have to do during the course of the experiment, like a system identification procedure, where we go from uh, light input to firing output, uh, and mod producing an actual model of the, the relationship between optogenetic input, uh, optical input and firing output. Um, and then controller design based on this, and then implementation, so it's uh, really kind of quick. I think we actually have some ideas about how to make that even faster. Um, but the, the observer here in this case is very simple. It's an exponential filter. Um, it essentially just um, um, smooths the spiking activity to give uh, a reasonably good measurement of instantaneous firing rate. And so we, the paper talks a lot about the design of this, but this sort of 
just right is it somewhere in the middle. Is, um, uh, the, the time scale can't be too fast nor too slow. Um, but we also, for modeling of the system, the underlying dynamics, um, we used a simple LN model. So in this case, it was a maximum likelihood approach where there's a linear filter followed by a static nonlinear function. We then fit this. This is all through the literature, and at least in our genre of work. Um, but we estimated these things and then used that as the design for the controller. Uh, so once you have the controller, in, once you have the system in place, the model of the system, and an observer, we can then estimate the parameters that would best minimize the error and so on. So there's lots of details I'm leaving out. Um, one thing I want to point out is that uh, two parameters that we found to be really important, one was an overall gain, uh, and the other was a, a, what we called a bias term. So this is a term that, at, that somehow adds into this that can shift the firing rates around in BC, and then a gain that's an overall amplifier. And it turns out we wanted to know how important is the model here? Models of neurons are terrible, right? We know this from the literature, we know this from our own studies, that we can't really predict what neurons do very well. So then if you're using that to build a controller, then you, you may be in trouble, right? Well, it turns out that the, the controller is actually fairly robust to, you, you don't have to make a, a perfect model, luckily, of the underlying dynamics. But we wanted to find out how, how robust did it need to be, how, uh, how accurate did the model need to be to make the controller work. So it turns out that we then vary these couple of different, we would go in, estimate what the system is, but then act, act as if we didn't know it and vary those parameters a bit to see how robust the control was to this. So it turns out the open loop control is terribly not robust to this. So as long, in this case, the way to read these plots, this is the tracking, this is the um, bias term and this is the gain term. A value of one means you've nailed it. Uh, so if, as long as you nail it and, and you have it exactly right, the open loop control is fine. You have a great model. If you vary from that a little bit, this is error plotted on the vertical axis that it's, a, it's very, very sensitive. The open loop control in red is very sensitive to uh, these having a model mismatch, not, not accurately identifying the dynamics. Whereas the closed loop controller is much more robust to this. It's pretty forgiving, actually. You can push it to a certain extent, but then it falls off uh, at some point when you deviate from the true parameters. This is all in simulation. So let me show you some experimental examples. Um, this is an example from Thalamus, where this is a desitized rat. Um, where we're trying to track the sinusoidal um, signal in green. The actual is shown underneath it in black. Um, and the control signal is shown in blue at the bottom. In cortex, we've got an electrode that's measuring uh, both a single unit. So this is the instantaneous firing rate we're measuring in cortex. And this is the lo cortical local field potential. So you can see this kind of driving at the level of the thalamus and then the downstream effect of this in cortex. This is a very simple example. This is the cortical spectrogram that shows a shift and a modulation right at the stimulation frequency, as you might expect. Um, here's an example from the thalamus, which is known to, which first of all, gates information flow to the cortex, but is no, known to exhibit different distinct modes of firing, uh, tonic and burst firing. And so it turns out that when we just try to drive the thalamus to a constant firing rate, um, and this, in this case with channel rhodopsin, uh, we get a significant amount of bursting. And again, anesthetized animal. I'll show you some awake data in, in a little bit. Um, but this is uh, in the anesthetized rat. We get a significant amount of bursting. The bursts are shown in, in the red dots here in this raster plot. Uh, and it turns out that we're just driving a lot of bursting activity. And as a result, in cortex, we see, and this is a single trial of local field potential and a single trial of the bursting activity that we record in thalamus, that there's a, a direct link between the driving bursting activity in the thalamus and this kind of oscillations in the cortex that we get. So the, there's consequences to this, to driving it this way. Uh, Michael Bolas, who's the student who did this work, um, had some insight to actually create uh, the control that's riding on top of a DC level of, uh, of, of constant light. And so in this case, what it does is depolarize the neurons just enough to, um, to take it out of this regime and all the firing is suddenly not bursting anymore, but tonic firing. Um, five minutes? Okay, I think I can do that. Wait, I'm timing myself up here. I got more than five minutes, don't I? Okay. All right, no, okay. Um, you gotta watch this guy. He's trying to get back some time. Um, I, I can do this, I can do this. Um, so in any case, um, we, can, we can pull, we can change the mode of firing at the level of, of thalamus. Uh, and I'll skip this example, same kind of thing in cortex. What's that? <laughs> 
it's, it's, it's all right, it's all right. All right. Um, yeah, according to this, I have 10 more minutes. Okay, Whew. all right. <coughs> that put a little bit of a, a pace in my heart. Okay, so, um, so this is an example. Uh, so you may have noticed when Michael Heuser was presenting earlier uh, and, and Miriam was presenting her work, in, in most cases, um, stimulation is done in this kind of pulsatile, whether it be electrical or, or optical. It's often done in a pulsatile way where you modulate the frequency of pulsing. And this is an example where pulsing at the level of, uh, and this is cortex, you're pulsing in cortex. Uh, maybe I'll show, go back one, one slide so I, now that I know I have a little bit more time. This is pulsing at the level of thalamus. And what you see across trials is just really regular firing of the thalamic neuron you're recording from. It just really drives it like a clock. But there's consequences to that. You're likely synchronizing all the nearby neurons. And downstream in cortex, when you record, you see this really driven activity that is the consequence of this synchronized activity in the level of thalamus. However, when you provide instead continuous light delivery, which has its own caveats, but in this case, it's not so synchronized anymore, at least across trials and presumably across neurons. And the consequence downstream is that you've not synchronize the activity so much at the level of cortex. So there's a lot to do here, but you imagine there's some knobs you can turn uh, here. Same kind of deal in cortex, but I'll skip through that. Okay, so what I think is potentially a really intriguing place to take this is, you know, this is a little bit more about driving specific activity in the last few slides, but there's been a number of discussions about brain state, and I think this is another area where maybe living at a different time scale maybe a different spatial scale where we can actually do something really important here as a community. So um, when we apply a bunch of different, we, you know, our lab work does a lot of different approaches to measuring and manipulating activity across the thalamus and cortex and so on. And we always talk about, you know, these other inputs, these other modulatory inputs to cortex and to thalamus that we acknowledge are unmodeled dynamics. We don't know where they're coming from. They're certainly brain state related as you move into the awake animal. There's uh, changing uh, dynamics uh, on all different time scales. Um, so what we think is important is to develop notions of adaptive control. So being able to tolerate and deal with um, changes in under underlying dynamics. So I want to show an example. In this case, this is an open loop example where we're asking a thalamic neuron to switch back and forth between 10 hertz and a pretty low firing rate. So you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And at some point, just during the experiments, open loop control, um, we've done a lookup table. Here's the control signal. Uh, at some point, the neuron just you know, goes out to lunch somewhere or just decides not to fire. And all, every, all electrophysiologists have seen this at some point where neurons kind of wander in and out of the party. Um, so we have to deal with this in some way if we're trying to really drive robust activity. So remember the two parameters that I talked about, the gain and, and bias terms. Um, so it turns out that if we just acknowledge that those two things might actually be changing as a function of time, we can then re-estimate those on the fly. So I won't go into lots of detail, but we took this 1950s control problem and gave it a new life in this kind of state space representation of linear dynamical system approach that Miriam talked about. Uh, but it's basically still this LNP model, linear nonlinear Poisson, but expressed in this kind of state space regime. And the nice thing about it is the controller then has uh, not only um, measurements of some observation of the firing rate, but also an on-the-fly re-estimation of these parameters as it's going along. So we've implemented all this stuff in hardware. And I should mention, this is where the commercially available hardware just didn't do it for us. And so we ported everything over to RTXI at this point, which is the real-time experimental interface that, was, that John Newman talked about a bit earlier. There's other different ways to do this, but this is a real problem, and it's very, very hard, actually, to, do, to implement these kinds of things uh, in hardware and, and, and in algorithmically. Um, so we implemented this kind of problem and then used very standard LQR, which is linear quadratic regulator control law. It's an optimal linear control law that operates on uh, state observation as well as error terms. So um, when you do this, suddenly you have a different story. So this is a case where the neuron, we're asking the neuron to do something, and then at some point, there's a perceived change in the gain underlying this. We're re-estimating this thing on the fly, saying, all right, well, how responsive is the neuron to my optogenetic input? Well, it's becoming uh, less and less responsive, so the control signal boosts and bumps up in response to this, and you compensate for what would have been a dropout. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a very practical 
kind of blue collar problem, but it's a real one. Um, but it also might, those underlying signatures might reveal underlying processes and dynamics that we actually might want to know about. So um, a different kind of problem might be just to acknowledge that there are different brain states. Um, and so there might be a switching between different brain states. So in terms of, we've, we've observed this during behavior, we, do, we train um, rats and mice to do different kinds of tasks where we, in this case it's a rat, uh, we ask to then deliver a, a, a whisker stimulus and the animal has to lick for a reward, very similar to what uh, you're probably familiar with this from the literature. And we then use um, uh, voltage imaging at the level of cortex and this is a, a genetically engineered voltage indicator called arc light. Um, and deliver a, a stimulus, a whisker stimulus, that depending on the strength of the stimulus, the evoked response in fluorescence in the cortex uh, is modulated by this in a monotonic way. I would like to come back to the earlier discussion uh, where there was a discussion about um, the activation of all of cortex. It's totally true. However, very fast time scales, these kind of voltage indicators, um, have the ability to ex show the uh, arrival of, for example, very focused activity at the level of cortex just in the first few, like 10 milliseconds or so, and then, so it comes up and then pew, goes across the cortex. So anything that's not quite that fast, I think is gonna catch it as an all cortical thing, but it's totally true that it goes across cortex. Um, but at least in our hands, these things come up and spread out. Um, okay, so, um, so in this case, we see pre-stimulus activity and fluorescence, when we parse it by hits and miss trials around threshold, there's a difference in the fluorescence. This is unpublished stuff, it's a little bit raw, but the idea is um, that the miss versus the hits have some kind of difference in fluorescence that precedes the stimulus. Yeah. Um, the level of the thalamus, this is some published data, but this is thalamic single unit recording that pre-stimulus firing rate in the thalamus is also different between hits and miss trials. So we know this from lots of literature that the ongoing activity is somehow predictive of performance in, in some scenarios. So the idea would be in, is to acknowledge the potential switching between different states. In a wake mouse, we see switching between different mean levels of firing rate on this sort of time scale, pretty dramatic. Lots of laboratories have reported this. Um, so the question is how do you deal with this? And one way, one problem we've been working on is this kind of state switching or state aware control where we acknowledge that there are two, two distinct states or more uh, and develop controllers around those different states where, that have very different dynamics. And the job is, is tricky because you have to estimate what state you're currently in and then apply the controller to the system. And then when there's this transition to a different state, you have to switch the controller. So this is kind of a classical controls problem, but applied in this kind of complicated scenario. Uh, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll say that we've done the, the, the uh, state estimation uh, problem using hidden Markov models and we've implemented this in simulation and we're just about in the experiments right now. The last couple slides I just want to talk about a different version which I think touches on what Miriam was describing in controlling state. So I think there's some opportunities not just to be aware of state changes, not just to deal with it in terms of acknowledging it, but to then potentially guide and change uh, state. So last couple slides. Um, this is a wake mouse. This is a control animal, uh, sorry, control case where this is activity in the VPM region of the thalamus, whisker region of the thalamus. Single unit being recorded from across different trials. Uh, just spontaneous activity, whatever spontaneous means anymore, I'm not sure. Um, but the, uh, and, and then these neurons have been induced to express uh, halo rhodopsin. So by uh, pumping in different levels of light, we can see that there's sort of a decrease in the overall firing activity here, but an increase in the bursting activity. So in the wake animal, we can induce this kind of bursting. And one thing that's really intriguing is, the, is what it does for sensory encoded signals. So in this case, control, you get a, a whiskered stimulus comes along, there's some kind of response. This is a peristimulus time histogram of the response, burst versus tonic firing. When you hyperpolarize the thalamus, um, deliver a stimulus, bam, there's an increase, and this is very preliminary, but this is an increase in firing activity in the thalamus, an increase in bursting, an increase in firing activity, so an enhanced response. And then when you simultaneously image downstream, there's an enhanced cortical response. So we have this kind of knob we can turn on the thalamus, push it down a little bit, um, but not too much, you don't want to shut it off, but we 
hyperpolarize it slightly, and it puts it in its regime that you get this um, burst of activity and in a, uh, an enhanced cortical response. So you can kind of imagine if you can get this into the behavior, you can start to test whether that enhances detectability and what it, what it means for the animal. So what we envision, cl closing it up, is, um, is acknowledging that there are different states in different parts of the brain, just using the thalamus and cortex as, as an example. For example, switching back and forth between whether it's tonic burst modes or, or high firing rate regimes, low firing rate regimes. Cort cortex, there's the long literature of thinking about synchronized and desynchronized states. Jess Carden gave a really nice description of some of these earlier. Uh, and within the synchronized states, up and down states, these are all sort of controversial things. But the interaction between these things, between thalamus and cortex, the literature is totally confusing, right? And I suspect, and I, this is complete wild conjecture, is that if there is a causality to this, thalamic state causes cortical state changes and vice versa, I think it's switching in time. I think potentially this is dynamic. You know, at some time, maybe the thalamus is driving cortex, and other times cortex is driving thalamus in different conditions and that could be a mess to disentangle. So perhaps, closed loop control of the rescue, you might be able to actually uh, clamp the, some notions of state at these different levels and look at these kind of interactions and look for causality in this. So um, in summary, closed loop optogenetic control, we can track these kind of fast dynamics. There's still a lot of work to do. There's, an issue, there's a later session about variability, I think, is a topic. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see how this connects to that. But potentially, we have a knob we can turn on at least some aspects of variability. Mike Heuser was talking a bit about reliability of neurons and, be, and sort of rescuing neurons. I think there's a variability uh, um, opportunity here. That sounds strange, but whatever. Um, and closed loop control is robust to the mo moderate models, but we do need models. The models are very important to actually drive this. Um, and that adaptive control is a really important thing. The brain adapts, and we need to develop tools around that. And then hopefully that you see that there may be an opportunity for this state, uh, control of state. And I think the wish list, uh, is, you know, we need to extend to a population. This is really reduced dimensionality, but as we look at multi-electro recordings or two-photon imaging wide field and looking at lots and lots of cells, we've got to be able to deal with this at a large scale combined with imaging. Um, Bidirectional control, we need to be able to Turn, turn the knob on the neurons in both directions. Right now, we can only push it in one di direction. Uh, extend to behavior and publish and share the tools. We all should be doing that, obviously. So with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you. Is it working at all? What? Is it working? It's working. It sounds good. Sorry. Um, so I'm wondering what happens during this time when you just start driving, you know, especially in one of the first examples where the firing rate was irregular, it looked like it took a few seconds before it cut ah. with your signal, but yep. then it really does and just follows. It. it tracks. It does take time and that depends a bit on how um, aggressive your control um, law is. So if you really crank up the gain, you have some choices as a, as a designer of these things. If you really crank up the gain on the controller, it'll get there faster, but you'll have overshoot and sometimes But it takes oscillation. a millisecond per synapse. So even if you have 10 synapses on the way, it's going to be less than 100 milliseconds. So how come, where do the seconds come from? Oh, why does it take so long to, to track? Um, it's just that the... So part of the problem is in online estimating what the firing rate is. So that's a, that's a an ar somewhat arbitrary choice in, definition, in the definition of the firing rate. So there is some kind of moving window associated with just counting spikes and acknowledging that we need data to actually make an estimate of instantaneous firing rate. So that intrinsically has built in some amount of lag in it, you know, at least tens of milliseconds at least. Um, but there is also just an in, intrinsic lag in the, the way the controller, it doesn't act instantaneously. It does, it do, it's a little bit more gentle than that. So. Actually, kind of related to that, I was thinking, I mean, did you ever, instead of taking this windowed firing rate, did you ever try to do distance to correct spike time or something of that we, sort? We haven't done that. And in fact, I think Michael would be really well, Michael Hoyer would be well positioned to do that. We haven't done it at the level of like precise timing of neurons and, and, and inducing spikes exactly at specific times. We've sort of pulled out at a level of abstraction. Yeah. That's a good point. 
Um, oh. Just I guess the idea of switching between cortex and thalamus, it's two different states. I was wondering if you've played around with the idea of having two sites of two independent controls for cortex and thalamus. How would that work? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've only thought about it over beer. Um, <laughs> But how they would actually interact with each other, um, it's a good question. I think, you know, if you were just sitting down and thinking about it mathematically, you'd probably design a controller that would just talk about, they, they would just be extra channels of inputs and extra channels of outputs, and the controller would be designed around that in some way. So it wouldn't be this controller and that controller. They'd be somehow working together. Um, but it, as far as, you know, we haven't gotten that far yet. That's a good question. So. The, um, the paired manipulation you have is a connection that we know a lot about. Yeah. So wondering, do you see any evidence that you're tapping into the intrinsic synaptic dynamics of that connection? Can you see dilemma cortical depression depending <coughs> on stimulation, which should show up in the LFP yeah. and the cortex? Yeah. I mean, in can, fact, you, can you find that in, in the... Yeah, in fact, it's a that's a really good point. So if you just turned on, if you started driving the thalamus, it's known that there's a strong depressing synapse at the thalamocortical. The thalamocortical synapse is strongly depressing. So yes, you absolutely see that. A lot of these are kind of either averaged across trials or truncated, so you, you wouldn't necessarily see it. But this is something you absolutely do see at the onset. So you could potentially, not I'm not sure why you'd want to do this, but you could potentially compensate for adapt for a, like a depressing synapse, for example. You would you could actually um, as it depresses, you could then compensate for that and increase the level of stimulation to kind of flatten it out. So it could be I was kind of wondering also, sort of, if you can see that. I mean, that's a potentially another way of assessing the state of the system online, yeah. right? Is to look at the temporal evolution of the responses yeah, to the yeah. stimulus. Yeah, that's great. Should I? Um, so, just a quick question: in your closed loop controller. Um, so you mentioned it was better than open loop. Do you think that was mainly due to feedback or to the model that you built? So could you dissociate the improvement due to the feedback and due to the actual right. model of the system? That we actually, in the open loop design, we actually used the model but inverted it to then design the inputs. So I didn't say that at all. So I think we gave it the best possible shot we could. So we actually created a model and inverted the model and looked at what stimulus we would need to drive that output. But it was, I think the feedback is key. Yeah. But maybe I should, should just, I don't want to overstay my welcome. Maybe I should stop it and we'll go to the, the have the other speakers come up and we can, 